Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and talk about an area that I am worried about periodically over the last 30 odd years. I always get a bit nervous when I see these Greek words, epistemology, ontology. The nature of being, I suppose, is ontology, and to be or not to be the Beatitudes, that is the question that uh, Shakespeare put in Hamlet's mouth. A nice question, of course, but Shakespeare didn't give the response to alternatives, and maybe if he had, there wouldn't have been such a bloodbath at the end of the, uh, <laughs> at the, end of the play. So, um, right. How do I advance here? No? Oh, back. Sorry, you're on here. Back. <coughs> Just on here. You're on here. I'm on here. All right. Um, okay. No problem. This is the Aristotle. So, Mark anticipated a lot of what I'm going to say. I'm going to fill in some of the details and I'll rush through certain things. And having not bought my computer, I decided that one or two slides were irrelevant, so I'll jump over these. But I'm going to try and do a history of attitudes, some of the conceptual developments, talk a bit about methodology, and then talk about one of my obsessions, social representations. Now. When I talk to people in uh, Brussels and in various commercial sector organizations and so forth, on the whole, people are using, when they're measuring attitudes, the operational definition. Attitudes are what we assess in surveys and questionnaires. And the ideal type of that, I suppose, is the public opinion poll. Ask who you're going to vote for, get the sampling strategy right, and you can predict the outcome of the election. But people who go beyond trying to predict elections, gathering attitudes to uh, people on climate change, on this, that, and the other, uh, people note and lament a number of features. Firstly, that what people say and what people do uh, is not necessarily the same. Uh, everyone recognizes that the way the question is worded and sometimes the position of a question in a questionnaire can change the responses of people. So we have question wording effects and context effects. People have or will express in surveys and questionnaires attitudes to almost anything. So Stan Presser asked a number of Americans whether they approved of the Metallic Metals Act. And quite a number of people thought that was a grand idea, although it doesn't exist. And people's responses to uh, survey questions can be somewhat biased. Lots of research on autobiographical memory shows that our memory isn't quite as good as many survey designers would hope. And of course, people like to present themselves in a positive light, the social response bias. Now, all these sorts of complaints have been very extensively studied in the literature, but for the operationalists, the academic literature is not something that they refer to. They're interested in news, <coughs> public relations. They're not interested in <coughs> science. And I think that is a position they adopt at considerable cost to the quality of survey design and to the relevance of the interpretation. Now, um, when attitudes came into the social sciences, they were very much seen as part of the relation between the individual and the social, the individual and their social group. And famous works by Thomas and Unpronounceable, Zeniaki, I think, uh, looked at the Polish peasant in Europe. And essentially, they thought of attitudes as the way in which individuals express the social values of the collective. And that was picked up by Solomon Ash, who talked about social sentiments. Very much the same sort of idea, social sen sentiments being the individual take on the sort of fabric of society, on the cement between the bricks of society. But then, as we've seen, Gordon Allport comes along, and I'm in the 50% who do quote this since <coughs> I put it up. Allport's definition individualizes the attitude. It becomes the property of the individual 
And although it is described in this definition as learned, the process of learning is simply not alluded to. And Allport's definition becomes, I think, for social psychology, the sort of hard core of people's thinking about attitude. And it's captured in two sort of metaphors. One is the file drawer, i.e. that in people's heads is the functional equivalent of a filing cabinet, and they can pull out the relevant attitude when required. And secondly, it's the projectile model, like the blue touch paper of the attitude, and boom, the behavior will follow. And that was very much uh, developed in the Yale School of uh, Communications, very active during the Second World War, a whole host of social psychologists, Maguire and others, were trained there. And Rosenberg gave some order to Allport's definition, the famous three components model. So the attitude is the hypothetical variable, i.e. it exists but cannot be seen. Of course, there are social psychologists these days who are using CAT scans and functional MRI to look at the brain when people are thinking about a social object. And hey, presto, there's a red light in some part of the brain which crops up when people are thinking about a social object rather than a physical object. So you know, maybe the hypothetical variable has been identified or at least located to a particular part of the brain. I have to say, I think <laughs> this sort of uh, brain scanning uh, produces a lot of pretty pictures, but uh, nothing much more than that. However, so at Rosenberg, we had this hypothetical variable, the attitude, which is triggered by an external stimulus. And there follows three forms of observable response. Cognition, what you know about the object. Evaluation, what you feel about it. And behavioral disposition. And the idea was that these three components of the attitude operate in a dynamic equilibrium. So your attitude to David Cameron's latest view on scroungers is what you know about him and what he said, what you feel about it and what you'd like to do with him uh, if you kind of met him, or what you do at the in general election in 2015 if you care to vote that way. So this idea of a dynamic equilibrium between these three components is taken up in social psychology in a 10 or 15 year uh, research program on cognitive consistency. Vast amounts of research looking at the basis of consistency between these various components. And uh, in parallel, although I will talk a little bit more about methodology, uh, particularly liquor uh, following pioneering work by uh, Thurston, pulled from the uh, area of, uh, of uh, psychophysics the idea that attitudes could be measured. Uh, Thurston and Lickert showed how one could measure the evaluative component. And given that there was an assumption that the three components of attitude were in this dynamic equilibrium, people took up Occam's razor, empathy or not to be multiplied without necessity, and thought that that was the way to measure attitudes. <coughs> so endless questionnaires are measuring the sense of the extent of affect for and against particular objects and making some bold assumptions about what this means in terms of people's choices and decisions. Now, uh, very early on, it was fairly evident that what people say and what people do are not the same thing. And there was a famous study by Lapierre must have been uh, the sort of research project that anyone would love to have these days funded. The, uh, in the early days of motor vehicles, he took a very fancy motor vehicle around various of the southern states, and he was accompanied by a couple of, a, a Japanese couple. And they were entertained in various restaurants, bars, whatever, no, probably not bars at that time, restaurants and hotels and so forth. And then Lapierre wrote to the, uh, the uh, various places they visited and say, would you allow members of the Japanese race to be uh, guests in your establishment? And he found that on the whole, uh, as 
they went around and presented themselves. Uh, only one person, I think, uh, said that they wouldn't uh, give them a table at the restaurant. But uh, the so-called symbolic behavior, when responding to a questionnaire, something like 50% of those who bothered to respond said they wouldn't accept them. And there were lots and lots of studies which drew into question this idea of the projectile model, that attitudes lead directly to behavior. And then in 1969, a chap called Wick gathered up all these studies and various other studies, did a meta-analysis, and came to the conclusion as stated here, taken as a whole, uh, attitudes are more likely to be only significantly or unrelated to behavior. So, not a positive moment for the theory of the attitudes. But along comes uh, Martin Fishbein and Eisen with the theory of reasoned action. And this theory really contributes to a number of developments in terms of theorizing around the attitude over the next uh, 20 years. This is about 1980 he uh, produced this model. Now, what they do in this model is to not to suggest that attitudes predict behavior. They're interested in predicting behavioral intentions. They take the uh, aphorism, the road to hell is paved with good intentions as a guide, i.e. it may be possible to predict what people say they will do, but between what they will say they will do and what they actually do is something of a gap. So essentially, they reduce the attitude to two components, the cognitive component, knowledge, and the affective component, evaluation. So the attitude to the object is really what you know about it and what you feel about it. Now, in their model, the idea is that in order to predict the behavioral intention, one has to bring in something about the social context. And in Fishbein and Eisen's model, that is people's beliefs about what other people think they should do. Maybe their family, maybe their peer group, etc. Whether other people would approve or <coughs> disapprove of them behaving in a particular way. Uh, now, Fishbein and Eisen's model has been used extensively. The health beliefs model in uh, sort of applications of social and ordinary clinical psychology to uh, uh, people with various illnesses. It's been used with respect to environmental behaviors. It's been applied across a whole range of areas. And as people uh, conducted research using Fishbein and Eisen's model, one or two modifications were added. Uh, Eisen, for example, introduced the idea of perceived control. So the health belief model showed that lots of people who do bad things to <coughs> their body, like smoking and overeating and all that sort of thing, uh, say they very much like, you know, they have very positive attitudes towards not smoking or eating less. They think their peer group would also approve of that. But again, the road to hell. And so they introduced a modification, an additional element to the model. Does the person believe they have control? And it turns out that those smokers who don't believe they have control tend to be less likely to give up than those people who do believe they have control. And then I think it was Bencher and Speckhart found uh, with a bit of uh, multivariate fishing expeditionary that past behavior was actually rather a good behavior, a uh, good predictor of future behavior, i.e. that people have habits regardless of their attitude, regardless of what other people think they should do, habit is uh, an important uh, basis. And I think this was uh, with respect to American students taking uh, uh, prescribed substances. And a sort of extension of Fishbein and Eisen came in uh, Zala and Fazio writing in, I think it was the American Journal of Political Science, where what they suggest is that there's no such thing as an attitude per se. People create them online. They create them on demand, so to speak. When you're asked for an attitude in a survey, what you do is reflect over the various considerations, as they put it, that you have 
that come to your mind when you think about this particular object, and these considerations are then distilled into an attitudinal judgment. Now, they've done various elegant experiments to show how this, for example, explains rather well context effects. Because what does a context do? It makes certain considerations more salient than they would otherwise have been. So if you ask people about nuclear power, and you just happen to put in a question, uh, do you remember what happened at Chernobyl or Three Mile Island? Uh, then people will uh, have more salient of the memories of those nuclear disasters, and then ask the next question, do you think Britain ought to have more nuclear power stations? People will say, well, gee whiz, I don't think so, very unsafe. So although it explains, or it begins to explain how context effects may operate, the problem with their model, and again, it goes back to ontology perhaps, is um, what are these considerations? Um, they seem to be sort of free-floating. Um, they're, they're in people's memory. What's the difference between a consideration and an attitude, one would ask? And it's not entirely clear from their paper where they get to. There were one or two other interesting developments following uh, uh, Rissell's meta-analysis. Uh, one particularly I thought was uh, a rather elegant idea that came from Abelson. Abelson picked up from the idea of script theory in psychology where people had scripts like the um, sort of the famous ones the restaurant script where you know you book the table you stroll in you're shown to the table you order the meal <coughs> you pay and then you leave uh, and the script is like a sort of comic strip and what uh, Abelson argued was that attitudes might be a bit like that in that there's some attitudes which carry with them what he called a participant script, i.e. the individual sees themselves as part of the action. There are other attitudes where the actor, so to speak, or where the individual, I should say, is but an observer. And what Abelson was suggesting is that the failure to predict behavior from attitudes is that very often we're asking people about issues where they are observers. They're not participants in the script. They haven't thought of themselves as carrying out these particular actions. And then there was an, a very good paper by Kelman. And what Kelman pointed to was that the idea that somehow attitudes link uh, a, a unidirectional causal chain leading to behavior is just confounded by an awful lot of social psychology. So for example, role play. What's the point of role playing? The point of role playing is to introduce people to a new way of thinking about themselves. And apparently, if people do role play, they change their self conception of things. So, behavior can influence attitudes. Testing this cognitive dissonance theory showed quite clearly that if people behave in a counter attitudinal way without sufficient justification, their attitudes change as a consequence of that. So what Kelman was arguing is that attitudes and behavior are in some sort of mutual interdependent relationship. Sometimes attitudes lead to behavior, sometimes behaviors lead to changing attitudes. So altogether, the three component model, post Fishbein and post Wickett analysis, becomes uh, somewhat better defined or at least the problems associated with it better characterized. That's a very busy slide and I'm not going to cover it, but it just tells you a bit more about Fishbein and Eisen. <coughs> now, uh, at some point, uh, an American social psychologist got terribly upset and it was particularly with respect to the um, Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign. And Ronald Reagan seemed to get an enormous amount of votes because he made people feel good. The fact that he had no policies whatsoever was completely irrelevant. And uh, a lot of American uh, social psychologists felt that this was the end of the Enlightenment, that people ought to be thinking seriously about the political issues 
not merely responding to children waving flags, Ronald Reagan smiling, and whatever films he made before he became um, governor of California. So uh, what we see is, uh, it, and it's an interesting development of some ideas that came out of Freud, because Freud distinguished between primary and secondary processes. Primary processes are related to the id, and through that comes impulse and emotion, and secondary processes are linked to the ego, and they are sequential and thoughtful and you know, take into account the real world, etc. And we see the cognitive revolution in social psychology in a couple of models of attitude. Uh, people talking about peripheral and central processing, that was Petty and Cacioppo, and virtually the same. It's wonderful how people invent neologisms for exactly the same idea. Uh, Eagley and Chaikin come up with heuristic and systematic processing. And within their theory, there is a sort of underlying normative statement that people would be better if they were operating on central processing and systematic processing, and that peripheral and heuristic, these are the sort of ephemeral views of the uh, quarter-witted who's who have not been affected or influenced by the Enlightenment since the 18th century. But interestingly, we see a sort of counterblast from a number of people who are coming up a little bit in defense of uh, intuitive and spontaneous thought. Um, let, me, let, let me give you an example. Uh, this is a question to keep you awake. If a bat and ball cost one pound ten p, and the ball costs a pound more than the bat costs a pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Uh, now that's a question that uh, Danny Kahneman ha has in his book Fast and Slow Thinking, and it turns out that in the majority of educated audiences, about sixty percent of people say the ball costs ten p, because that's the obvious answer. Um, I won't go into the details. We needn't uh, embarrass anybody if they jump to that conclusion. I would admit I jumped to that conclusion when I was reading his book. Uh, so occasionally, when we do this type one thinking, we're sort of overwhelmed by the obviousness of the situation and we jump to a conclusion very quickly. We do not uh, engage in the counterfactual. We don't ask, you know, check up on the uh, answer, so to speak. And this is very much uh, part of his um, thesis that uh, he's not arguing that type one heuristic thinking is always leading us astray. Occasionally it does. And his idea is people need to be trained to recognize when they need type two thinking, which is serious cogitation, scratching your head and so forth. And this is very much picked up by Geiger in the who runs a uh, laboratory, one of the Max Planck in Institute, where instead of thinking about heuristics as uh, silly shortcuts by quarter wits, he treats them as what he calls fast and frugal ways of thinking. That essentially we spend an awful lot of time having to make quick decisions. Uh, some of those are on trivial matters and some are impo on important matters. But Essentially, if we were not to have these fast and frugal heuristics, we would spend so long getting out of bed, deciding whether to take an umbrella this morning, how are we going to commute to work, and so forth. <coughs> if we had to think through all these things in detail, we'd never get anything done. And also in risk perception, which is an area I'm quite fascinated by, uh, the standard idea of risk perception is that people look at the probability of the hazards occurring, and they look at whether those hazards are going to bring uh, the, extent of the extent of negative consequences. So if you've got the probability times the negative consequences, you can work out whether it's a risk that you should take or not. And that has guided risk perception for 20 or 30 years. And slowly it comes along with what he calls the effective heuristic, which is that some people look at a risk and say, no, that's OK. I'll, you know, I'm happy with that one. And they don't go through these machinations of collecting up all the uh, data. So the cognitive revolution produced 
within attitude theory uh, almost the individual as a rational decision taker and attitudes are formed on similar processes. There's a good deal to the attitude that goes beyond those rational processes. And there's also a good deal to be, or there's something to be said about the way in which the cognitive revolution took the social out of social psychology. So you know this famous um, ambiguous figure. The two faces there are to represent the individual, and it is looking at the individual cortex that an awful lot of social psychologists spend their time. And they ignore what is between the faces, the social context. <coughs> and it seems to me, at least in <coughs> social psychology, what we should be looking for are those theories which engage between the individual and the social and begin to explore the social mechanisms that link individual and social context. And I note two or three studies where People have looked at uh, blood donation and the way in which people's personal identity drives their continuing donation of blood rather than some sort of trade-off in terms of societal benefits or not. Then uh, there's a very interesting study by uh, Di Giacomo and also Runciman's work where, in a way, it's identity, group identity that links to what the individual thinks and chooses to do to the uh, social context, what other people uh, also think. So things like social identity theory, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, developed by Henri Karstel, would be a classic example of a social mechanism. We have uh, a focus on the micro level, the individual. We have a focus on the meso level, the uh, notion of social identity, and that is the product of the association of minds, conversations, and so forth. So my uh, enthusiasm over the last few years has been to try and think through how we might treat the social in social psychology. And um, this is a model which my colleague Martin Bauer and I developed in about 1999 called the Toblerone model because after we developed it, it suddenly dawned on me that Martin was from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a nice attribution. So essentially, the idea is that we have two people, S1 and S2. And those two people are joined together by some kind of project, some kind of common fate. And along comes object O. Now, the existence of object O is not in doubt, but it, pr but it presents a challenge to these two people and their project. And the question is, how do they come to understand this particular challenge? How does the object take meaning in their lives? And we argue that it takes meaning in their lives because S1 and S2, in this minimal social situation, engage in conversations, they talk about it, they think about it, and they come to some sort of agreement as to what the object is. But, and we're interested in the production of social knowledge, we have to bring in a time dimension, and that's the extension. So that as time changes, the object may change in its primary ob objectivity, so to speak. I'll give an example in a second. And as over time, Maybe the object changes or the people change. So as we go over time and we take a cross-section through the Toblerone, we get the representation of that particular object. Now, social representation theory was uh, introduced to this country by a chap called Moscovici. And it's uh, actually a form of um, contractual realism, which... Umberto Eco uh, developed. And Eco's point reflects the Toblerone model, or we reflect in the Toblerone model Eco's point, that there is a reality out there. There are group facts in Searle's construction of the world. But 
what those groups fact mean to people is well, somewhat ambiguous. And so a community gets together to find out what it does mean, how we understand the need. And so Martin Barrow and I picked modern biotechnology, genetic engineering, as the vehicle for our study of social representation. And the question we posed ourselves is, why has modern biotechnology developed so many different identities, so many different meanings for different groups in society? So we've got industry saying this is the best thing since the, uh, uh, I don't know, agricultural revolution. We've got uh, Greens saying it's the end of civilization as we know it. We'll all be um, eating genetically modified foods and that will affect our genetic structures. And then we've got a whole host of different positions. <coughs> so essentially what we are arguing is that these representations, these identities <coughs> of modern biotechnology come through social processes. They come through informal communication, i.e. people talking to each other, and formal communication, people reading newspapers, magazines, and so forth. Um, and that's how we try to uh, bring the social back into individual thinking, that an individual's common sense is a social product. And when people come to terms, as we find doing qualitative research and so forth, uh, where as people come try to come to terms with the challenge of something like modern biotechnology. People draw on available sources, lots of myths, Frankenstein, Frankenfoods, um, images, uh, the, the media representations and so forth. These then provide anchors for understanding. Only one minute. Have but you got freedom to get a one go up? Right, oh sorry. Yeah. So these provide the anchors and this creates the, uh, the, the lay perceptions of these objects. So I'm going to rush. So what I'm arguing is that attitudes are a form of representation. What attitudes do for us is the rank order of the world in terms of preferences. But there are a lot of other representations that we shouldn't ignore. Values, which are uh, views about preferences about states of the world, attributions, great deal of work in social psychology on attribution theory. That's a representation of who's responsible for something happening. Uh, risks, representations of things that we worry about. Trust, who do we believe? And my, our argument would be that only philosophers think alone. Most other knowledge is a social product. So briefly on attitude measurement, I've only got one minute. Uh, as I said, and uh, as Mark alluded, Thurston, Lickett developed various ways of scaling the uh, evaluative dimension. And the Lickett scale, five, seven, nine points, people debate what is the best scale, uh, is uh, almost standard uh, within survey research. Analysis, in my view, far too little money is spent on analysis I work on surveys for the European Commission, which cost around 800,000 euros. And if they put 30 or 40,000 euros into analysis, they think that's far too much because they're only interested in means and percentages. Uh, far more should be spent on analysis. And I want to give you some examples because I'm sure other people will be uh, talking about ways of looking at survey data. Uh, latent class method which we are exploring. Late in, in most methods, uh, structural equation, modeling principles, components, confirmatory <coughs> factor analysis, one is making some quite uh, heroic assumptions about the quality of data. You're thinking that five, seven point scales are interval data. With latent class analysis, you just assume it's ordinal data. And this is uh, some work we did uh, around human embryonic stem cell research. There's a big dilemma for many people because on the one hand, people are fooled 
by the value of duty of care. We have to alleviate his misery. But equally, people are worried, some people are worried about the sanctity of life. Is the embryo a human being in the making and so forth? So we have these four questions. I won't read them out. You can see that what we're trying to do is illustrate in uh, the four questions these two uh, competing values. And uh, what Leighton class does is it's a data reduction technique, but it doesn't do what factor analysis does, which the, the principal co components, which just pulls out a Wattenbroek for factor, which is normally people are for or against, and then a few subsidiary factors. What Leighton class does is to look at the pattern of responding across the four items and pick out classes of people who respond in a similar way. And it just happens for this one, which is rather two elephants, actually. Uh, there are four clusters, there are four classes, but it could have, you, c you can go to six, you can pick any number you like. If it's interpretable, there you go. And what you see in the uh, dark blue is those people who strongly uh, go for duty of care, and in the dark yellow, you have the sanctity of life, and then you have strong believers, and then in between the two, you have the moderate duty of care, moderate sanctity of life. And this is a very useful way of doing, I think, comparative research. So you probably can see some of the names down there. This is a Eurobarometer survey. And it certainly helps my colleagues who come from various countries to reflect on the public debates on these issues and to uh, try to understand how, uh, well, how the public feel about these pressing dilemmas with respect to some applications of modern biotechnology and how that might be reflected perhaps in public policy. So thank you very much for listening. I just want to make three comments in my minus one second. Collecting responses to a handful of statements uh, is prototypical in an awful lot of survey research. And I think this is the pursuit of news and not social science. Uh, I think, and I would like to impress on you, the value of designing surveys on the basis of social scientific ideas and concepts. I think it's important to think about these issues of social mechanisms. When we're collecting attitudes, we're not just looking at individuals, we're looking at individuals in social contexts. And I'd finally like to say, don't ignore the fields of attitudes, because those who ignore history are condemned to relive the past.